Um, but what I would like to do, just as our time begins to run down, is look at what I would call traditional uh, storytelling. Very quickly, again, we go into a, a uh, narrative sequence. Jack Shepard, small time thief, condemned for stealing a roll of cotton and a couple of spoons to death, 1724. There he is in a contemporary uh, print uh, in the death cell at Newgate uh, with these almost sort of comic padlocks and so on, which are an important part of the story. Um, a writer called Daniel Defoe, who himself had been in Newgate prison, suddenly thought it would be interesting to write this man's life. But the problem is, at the period of, we're talking about biography, is about the great and the good or the seriously evil. And a small time petty thief, aged 22, is not presenting a great subject for biography. But Defoe looks at this and looks at this, and he decides he can tell it by standing the genre on its head. He reversed the reader's expectation because before his execution, Jack Shepard had escaped from that cell, not once, not twice, but three times. And Defoe suddenly realized that is the story. It's the story of a man who is not crushed, a young man, by the terrible conditions, and who is clever enough and determined enough, and as it turns out, good human enough, to break out three times from a death sentence. And that becomes the basis of a brilliant short biography published in 1724. Um, I can only just dash through it. Um, that uh, the publisher realized that Defoe had constructed a wonderful story, the escape story. And that's the actual, it's very glad I know the, it, but it's like a strip cartoon. You can see, first of all, there are the manacles that Jack Shepard had, and there is the method he escaped. Here's a Victorian version of that, which clarifies it. Um, at the work of genius uh, that Jack Shepard, the idea he had, and it, it was something to do with his sense of humor. I think that his method of escape depended on his sense of humour. He mocked the guards, and Defoe makes wonderful use of this dialogue. I'll just give you one. Uh, there's a throwaway line he kept saying whenever the priests come to visit him, to give him blessing before execution. He says, one file is worth a lot of Bibles. And he keeps saying that in file. But in fact, he's a brilliant, with, as Defoe describes, with cracking locks. Another thing he mocks his people with, he says, um, I am the shepherd, Jack Shepherd, and all you jailers are my, uh, part of my flock, and you'll come buying after me. And there's a wonderful deferrer uses that word, bar, B A A A A N G, the sheep. And of course, it's a lovely blasphemous remark as well. So, um, round this, Defoe constructs the narrative of how he escapes. And without going too far into it, the, the brilliant, where I say the sense of humor, was that instead of going what, what anybody else would have done, which is to tie to get through the door or the window and go down and escapes on the third floor, Jack Shepard realizes there's a chimney in his cell and that it's been boarded up, but he can crack through it. And he goes up, he escapes upwards through the chimney. And there's a wonderful series of accounts of the various doors he has to break through. And he simply will not be stopped just give you one, one quote from this, and Defoe, then beginning to turn, is per practically like Pilgrim's Progress by the time Defoe has finished with this narrative. Um, one little brief. I Here I came, this is um, Jack Shepard speaking, Defoe making him speak. Here I came to another massive door, which being fastened by a very strong lock, my spirits began to fail me. But cheering up, I wrought with great diligence, and in less than half an hour, with the help of a nail from the red room and a spike from the chapel, wrenched that lock box off and made the door my humble servant. Uh, it's a w wonderful account in which he, uh, that Defoe had taken directly um, from Shepherd. And I, I haven't time to go up for, but there's a very modern scene that the third time he escapes, um, Shepherd uh, goes, of course, to a pub and he's sitting in the corner and he starts hearing the people in the pub talking about the news of Jack Shepherd's escape. 
and they're all saying, how did he do it? And there he is in the corner listening. Very modern idea. Uh, and Shepard, in fact, so impressed by this, um, he breaks into a tailor shop, steals an entire gentleman's outfit, calls on his girlfriend, puts her in a coach, and they ride past Newgate entrance and then they go to a pub where they consume three quarts of a pint of best brandy each at which point they're caught again and this is the final the final twist this is all in wonderfully in this narrative the final twist is that Defoe is hung and you you know the cart through Tyburn and so into the present marble arch and as he's on the cart at Tyburn Defoe steps up onto the cart and hands him the printed version of his life. So at that moment that the, his own life has been taken away, Shepherd, the young, illiterate Shepherd, suddenly realised his life is going to last. And it does last because it becomes, it goes, I'll just give you again a quick, quick example. Here's um, Jack Shepherd in drag in Victoria Music Hall. Again, the, the notion of escape. It, he becomes the subject of a Harrison Ainsworth novel. Bertolt Brecht's Strepney Opera is partly based on him, and it goes on and on. There are several Hollywood films. I saw a television dramatization only last year. So again, this point I'm making, powerful, good, biographical narrative has this extraordinary impact, and it can go on and go on through other media. Um, and I could, we could relate this to things like uh, Sam Johnson's account of Richard Savage and so on. But that's the single point I want to make there. So, um, we need to head uh, towards the chequered flag, I think. I just want to say something about part, my part for biography and the futures, plural. It seems to me that um, it is futures because it seems that I feel biography now, the more I've had a chance to study it, um, that it has separate roles in different cultures and in different nations. Um, and it seems to me that you can already see that the role it has here, uh, if I may say in a pre-Republican Australia, is different from the role it's having in, in a very post-imperial England. They are subtly different, the roles they have to play. And certainly if you follow this in France or in America, again, you see these differences. Just give you a little snapshot in England. I think there is, there is I don't want to give an impression of that the form is in any way uh, exhausted there. Quite the contrary, quite the contrary. Um, um, one of our leading Shakespeare scholars, Jonathan Bate, whose work some of you will know, he's wrote a very interesting essay recently saying that he thought that using this scientific term, there would be, there's a paradigm shift coming in the way biography is now being written. And I think one of the things he meant, but, there are still major life and times biographies, and very fine ones. Claire Tomlin's um, Sam Peeps, Hilary uh, Sperling's that wonderful two-volume Henri Matisse, which some of you would know, uh, Hermione Lee herself, the Edith Wharton book. These are big, traditional, brilliantly researched, solid biographies still being written. And incidentally, look out for the, there is a new Michael Holroyd, which is a great event, particularly has been rather ill, and then marvellously he's finished this big book about Henry Irving and Ellen Terry and that group of uh, the theatrical players and directors and producers. And it's got this wonderful group title, which is A Strange Eventful History. Okay, watch out for that. It's just, just being published. Those are the traditional forms, but something else is happening. <coughs> um, there is a widespread questioning of that kind of book. There is a fascination with briefer and more experimental work. Uh, I think there is uh, a growing interest in marginal and subversive subject matter. Um, there is a lot of interest in biography of groups, of particular friendships, of particular love affairs, and in the Wordsworthian sense, there's spots of time, what I call microbiography. You take one small part of a life and examine it very closely. And out of that, you can see a whole pattern, larger pattern of a life. That kind of way of working interests us very much. So not just the neglected life, um, but also the life in miniature, and also what I call the collective lives. We are all seem to be very interested in that. Um, I just, again, throw out one of these uh, book lists. It's just uh, there. That's, oh yeah, we republished the fur, I'm glad to say that um, I just picked out all those books 
um, have uh, their forms, their biographical forms of narrative are very, very unusual. I can't go in uh, to all of them except to say, since we were talking about Jack Shepard, that number five, Stuart, A Life Backwards, is an extraordinary sort of rerun of that or of Johnson's Life of Savage, written by a young Cambridge PhD who suddenly got interested in the man sitting outside his college on the pavement, begging. He suddenly got interested in that man. And from that, an extraordinary story, a kind of modern Boswell story, but in reverse, that uh, Alexander Masters forgets about his PhD and instead writes the life of this down and out who is not just a down and out, who is a very, very remarkable character. Uh, and that book, which I recommend, is just one of them, and you'll see the forms, the use of dialogue and so on, and the use of narrative. It is a, to a story that is told backwards, that you start with where Stuart is, but you work back towards his childhood. How did this happen? How did this happen? Very good piece of powerful narrative, not chronological in that sense, but with an extraordinary effect. And, of course, it has become a, a very fine TV um, documentary as well. So again, the, the idea that good narrative knocks on, changes its media and so on. Uh, so I just, just leave that up there for a second. But I want to add um, that I think uh, for, I think that one of the areas where uh, new biography is working in a most interesting way is in science biography. Um, that's, some of you will know, that's the statue outside the British Library Courtyard. It's based on Blake's famous drawing of Newton. Uh, it's by Eduardo Palozzi, the sculpture. And it's ironic because, of course, Blake regarded Newton as a demonic figure who destroyed the imagination, who was anti-romantic and so on. But here he is looking, and this is what's rather interesting about that, looking like Mary Shelley's Dr. Frankenstein's creature very complicated um, a passing down of certain kinds of identity. And to me, that represents the old two cultures, wars in a way, science and literature combined in, in that statue. But I think now, I think it is, those are old wars, um, and the writing of scientific lives um, is developing, as it were, by leaps and bounds, I think. Uh, when I first looked at this, it seemed to me that so much of science biography was kind of children's stories, the kind of Eureka stories, you know, Isaac Newton and the apple falls on his head and he suddenly has the vision of universal gravity, bang, okay. And they, they even use that in advertising now, the apple, and in fact, that's what the machine that you all use, that's based on the Eureka story of the apple, that's why it's called that. But those are actually, they are children's stories in a way. Um, and also, a conventional science biography is very frightened of the history of error in science. Finds that very difficult to write about, at least it did. It tended to do what the academics call a Whig history of non-stop progress. Science is all progress, right? And also with that, the men and women who do the science are the people in white coats. Who uh, I notice here at, the, at Melbourne University, you can go in and you can buy a white coat. It, it's there, like you put it on. What happens? Does that mean that you have no heart, no soul, that you're an ice block, you're a scientist? Does it mean that, or what? So that, that effect of, of the traditional biography, which I think now is being completely overturned, and I think um, in, in now we're, for the 21st century, this will be one of the areas where biography has most powerfully developed. And why, why, because, all of us are now more and more concerned, clearly, with the future of the planet, global environmental issues and so on. And that has put science and the biographical element in science back on the menu with a vengeance, I might say. Uh, we all now realise that science doesn't and cannot exist in a human vacuum. It's done by somebody. We want to know about the people who make the science. We want to know how they do their discoveries and also we want to know how they make their mistakes. And we want to know what they're like in other areas. What do they believe in? What are their 
political beliefs, what do they believe about religion or love and so on. We want an entire human account of these people who are, of course, us, just us. And I think biography is going to give this wonderful way of looking in to the history of science, the history of scientists, to open that right up. And I think it's a thing we need right now. To give you, um, again, one of my quick book lists, those seem to me, or starting with a very popular Longitude, you remember, which was about the Harrison clock and so on, those are currently books, some of them are a collection of essays, um, which I think are doing, making this kind of breakthrough. Um, and you'll see that, uh, now here at number nine, I've shamelessly put my own book, which is right there, uh, because it seemed to me that was the task as a biographer having written about the Romantic period. It seemed to me the thing that we'd all left out, politics and poetry and so on, and nature and poetry and so on, we'd left out the huge impact of what was going on in science in that period, say between 1780 and 1830. And that's what I've tried to write about, which is, for me, has been a complete, you know, in, in, in my mid-60s, I had to re-educate myself entirely. And I've loved doing it, actually. And to some degree I've succeeded, and to some degree I've failed, which is very helpful, I think, somehow. Very good to keep one up. I call that the um, subtitle of this book, uh, there's the cover, uh, is How the Romantic Generation Discovered the Beauty and Terror of Science. And the book is about the two sides of that, and it looks at a whole series of very remarkable people. Um, the great uh, observational astronomer William Herschel, the great chemist Humphrey Davy, great explorer Mungo Park. My chorus figure is Joseph Banks, a figure some of you will know from your childhood in classrooms, this sort of unapproachable rock-like figure, the president of the Royal Society there, with his, the order of the bath around him, and you think, God, what did you sound like, growl, and he's been 42 years in the chair. The opening shot of my book is this chap, age 25, jumping down, of the Endeavour ship, Captain Cook's Endeavour, onto the beach at Tahiti, and what then happens to him in the next three months. Extraordinary experience for him, it affects the whole of the rest of his life. And although he does become this president, for the rest of his life he's sending out young men and young women to take part in kinds of explorations of all different, looking at the stars, going into Africa, uh, ballooning, as you know, a subject very close to my heart. Um, and I've tried to write about in this book and show the impact this has on writers and, again, ordinary people like us. Because one of the things I've discovered, and I didn't know this when I set out, is almost all the issues that we are now worried about, ranging from science, discussing... Um, it's very difficult to pick, but let's say the impact of uh, expanding notions of the universe on our belief systems. Uh, in this time, with homemade telescopes, William Herschel and his sister Caroline, very, very interesting in that relationship, found the first new planet for 2,000 years, Uranus, and suddenly the solar system expanded. But much more than that, they were the first people who saw that we are in a separate galaxy, the Milky Way, and that there are other galaxies out there, notably Andromeda, which are unimaginably far away. And suddenly the universe, from being this closed little temple, and I may say a Christian temple, suddenly becomes something completely different. It's, and as Laplace, the great um, French astronomer, says, I have spent my life looking at the stars, and nowhere have I found a sign of God. Very interesting, that, that approach. Suddenly, very, very radical attack on religion and so on. This begins there. The whole notion of what makes human life, it's, the, it's part of, you all know the Frankenstein story, but there's a very interesting, absolute, genuine science behind that. They're looking into what uh, role electricity has uh, uh, in animating matter. S serious and also terrifying experiments were actually carried out there. And the notion that people begin to ask, is there an individual human soul? Do we or do animals have souls? Or if not, what? And if what, is it something that you could track? Is it 
a type of electricity? Is it a type of spark or what? Or don't we have that at all? Those questions, those kind of questions, many others uh, with exploration, geographical exploration, yes, the discovery, of the, say, of the Niger River, but what will be the impact of that discovery? What effect will it have on the civilizations that are already there? And we know, of course, disaster, disaster, disaster. All those issues are, occur in this period, in this romantic period. And writers like Shelley and Byron respond and I, you, you, their poetry suddenly begins to look very different. When you find Shelley writing about hot air balloons, Byron writing about chemical experiments, wonderful stanzas in Don Juan about Newton and the apple, connecting it to the biblical apple in the Garden of Eden. Some very, very funny. And he's, he knew, he'd looked through Herschel's telescope, he knew Humphrey Davy and so on. So I've tried to rebuild that whole image of what Romanticism is about in that book. So there we are. I'm a swine out. You've been very, very patient. Um, let me, I'm going to give you my ten commandments for young biographers. I, I promise you that. But just before I do that, can I just leave you with a slightly wider thought, which is, we, we talked about the development of this form, which you can tell that I passionately believe in. I've worked in it for 40 years, um, I don't intend, I intend to die with my boots on and I continue this because I think it's so worthwhile as an imaginative operation, um, as now as a teaching for young students and so on. Um, I, I, I think biography is like this gift we've been given this form, balancing the critical and the imaginative. But I ask myself, um, how far can biography stretch? What is happening in China? What is happening in India? What is happening in Iran? Does the form depend in some sense on a kind of uh, the liberal traditions um, of an open society, of uh, available libraries, of relatively um, unsuppressed self-expression, uh, the recognition of the value of the individual human life and, it, and its self-expression, and to some degree a secular society. Does biography depend on all that? Can it exist in an extreme authoritarian state where history is not free, where personal biography is not free? We don't know. We'll see. Um, I... Personally, I think, for example, I think in India, I think biography has a great future there for various uh, quite complex reasons about education, about the growth of a middle class there, because it's such a multicultural, diverse society. I see that as a, a place where biography could work. I wonder about China. Very interesting, just as I came here, I think yesterday, I saw that there is an, a new collection, an oral history uh, of... Chinese witnesses to the Cultural Revolution. And a Chinese historian has done a whole series of interviews with people now of considerable age on the basis that the younger generation not only don't understand what went on, but are not interested in what went on. And so this biographical tool, a series of life stories, is being used um, there to open up something in China. But I notice this book is not being written in Beijing, it's being written in London. So we're left with that. And so I, I, I leave you with that. And now I'm going to give you my blessing and my Ten Commandments. Um, I ask you not to read ahead of the line. All right? Bear with me as we go. Thou shalt honour biography in all its living forms and experiments. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbour's novel. <laughs> Thou shalt recognize that biography is a celebration of human nature in all its glorious contradictions. Thou shalt demand that it be greater than gossip because it is concerned with justice. Thou shalt require that though it chronicles an outward career, the facts, it reveals an inward life, a comprehensive truth of some kind. 
Thou shalt see that this truth can be told again and again and again unto each generation, and it requires humility to recognize that. Thou shalt greet it as a life-giving form, as it is concerned with the human struggle and the creative spirit which we all share. Thou shalt relish it as a holiday for the human imagination, for it takes us away to another place, another time, another identity, from which we can come back refreshed. Thou shalt be immodestly proud of it, as it is something that the Brits have given to the world, like cricket and parliament, and the full cooked breakfast, <laughs> and the Australians have reinvented like, and I had a long list of this, but I come up with the Sydney Opera House, the Walker House, Walkabout, and the Open Air Barbecue. <laughs> and lastly, thou shalt be humble about it, for it demonstrates that none of us can ever know or write the last word about the human heart. Thanks.